arahato sama sambudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambudasa homage to him the worthy one the fully enlightened one this is really good sadhu 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 okay I got it. It says we're being recorded. Okay, <laughs> see if I can make it go. Okay, now I'm going to take you in and open up this paper. I, I actually wrote this, I want you to understand, I wrote this for um, the women. How come this won't get bigger? I wonder why. Huh? Oh, here, I know, there. Oh, that's not right. Don't worry, everybody hang in there. We'll get there. <laughs> Let me see, how do I go out of here? Um, stop share. Okay, let's start share. And here's the, here's the document. Okay. So this one, you may I may have told you a little bit about this before. I can't remember, I'll be honest. But this is about... Um, Wait a second, Newton. Okay, okay. This is about um, the ten paramis and the ten fetters, and actually, it's about learning about the ten paramis, the ten fetters, and the consequence of the four attainments. Is what it should say, uh, because we wanted them to understand. I wanted them to understand um, without this whole, whole training being so that not because it's we the we want your voice is breaking well all right let me try this is that better Is it, is it better if I find No. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you hear me? It is breaking a bit. Hello? Do you, do you want to... Uh, can you hear, hear me? The voice is no. breaking. Oh, <sighs> it's breaking. No, wait, wait a second. Well, I'm not talking. No, I'm hanging up. But
um, the share screen. Okay. I don't see anybody. Why don't I see anybody over here? How come I don't see anybody? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, you can. Okay. Here, so here we go. So basically, um, I wrote this letter to the sisters at the um, at the monastery at the convent, and basically. Um, this is something that I prepared for them to be able to understand the important part that the paramis and the fetters play in the development of the Brahma Vihara meditation practice. So if you have any questions, you need to write me, let me know what you don't understand so I can explain it to you because I don't want you to have this halfway. It's important. The 10 perfections are the paramis. Form the uh, very basis for progress for your whole development. And these essential tools are to be developed to help reach the right condition for this uh, cessation to arise and for the experience of Nibbana to occur. However, they develop at a different rate in each individual. Mostly the speed of understanding is directly proportional with how well that you can follow the instructions exactly for your meditation training. So the paramis are completed by sheer practice, a simple list of the 10 paramis follow. Generosity is dana. Morality is sila. Renunciation is nekama. Insight is panya. Energy is wiria. Patience is kante. Truthfulness is adhitana. Loving kindness is metta, and equanimity is upeka. Conversely, to this list, there are 10 mental fetters called sampajanas, which inexorably will bind a person to worldly existence or samsara and suffering, the dukkha. These two also exist invariably within different people. The fetters are known as the tools of the evil one, Mara. In Christianity, we would say the devil, similar. It is these that keep the being captive in our golden cage made of pleasure, joy, and possessions, or love, attachment, self-interest, or notions, view, and values. In Pali, there are three levels or degrees of releasing these fetters. We say, Asati, Heve, Asas, Vakaya, Dita, Anusayo. This is the Pali talking about the levels. The underlying tendencies, the Anusayas. These defilements can be distinguished as three states within an individual. You will recognize this when I tell you. They are occurring progressively through three degrees. Define them is called the This is where the tendencies motivate unwholesome bodily and verbal actions. Usually, 
this is where the beginner starts. I have to check and see if I still um, have you. Where do I check? Good. I still have you. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes, we can. You can hear me? Okay, I'll keep going. So the beginner starts at that level where the is to make some bodily and verbal actions. This is where most of the world sits. The second level is Pariyutana level. And this is where the tendencies rise up to obsess and enslave the mind. So these tendencies are coming up and start to begin, you start to obsess with them, and they're there all the time. They're not just bodily and verbal actions, but you get more heavily involved in them. And the third level, this is where it's called Anusaya level. This is where the tendencies remain as mere latent dispositions in the human mind. They don't actually disappear what you're looking at is a human being who has been practicing and the mind has learned not to bring these up and use it. This points to the fact that the fetters, even when they do not come to active manifestation, still will continue as the Anusaya level so long as the remainderless way and cessation of the fetters has not happened yet through completion of the super mundane path that is ending with the attainment of arahatship and fruition. So first, take a look at the list of the 10 fetters. Get these list down of the 10 fetters so that you can see what you're actually going to eliminate. They are number one, the delusion of a personal self, and that is Atta. Number two, doubt about the path to Nibbana. Number three, mere rites and rituals will not take lead us, lead you to Nibbana. That you believe they will lead you to Nibbana is how it starts out. And the first, you'll see what happens in a minute. Craving for sense pleasure is number four, okay? Thoughts and acts of ill will and cruelty is number five. Number six is craving for divine existence in heavenly realms and deva lokas because it's really nice there. <laughs> and conceit is number seven. Number eight is sloth and torpor, semicolon, dull mind, semicolon, laziness. Number nine is restlessness, guilt, and remorse. And number 10 is ignorance. Now, as you develop your meditation practice, comprehension of this Dhamma increases with more clarity. First, there are five lower fetters that will begin to fall away. Number one through number five, weaken. The first time you go through to clear mind, Buddhists call this sodapana, which means stream enter. Upon going through for the first time, one number one realizes that the delusion of a personal self or the danger of taking everything 
over personally, but this is not completely released quite yet. You realize about personal self and atta versus anatta, but there is this danger still there of taking things over personally. Okay, the second part that falls away, the person loses any skeptical doubt about the fact that there really is a path to reach a clear mind. The Buddhist calls this clear mind experiencing Nibbana. The third thing that happens or falls away, the person gives up dependence on rites and rituals to reach this experience. Although they may still practice community services, celebrations, or chanting, they completely realize that just merit programs and such will not lead to this opening of the mind in the same way. Then we have a little colon here, a little marker. At this point, if you break a precept, you will feel it immediately, very quickly, and you will forgive yourself and take the precept again to yourself wherever you are and continue on with your practice. The next note is you have have seven more lifetimes to go through are what is predicted at this level before you are completely free of samsara rolling over the churning of lifetimes. And the next point was the second time now that you go through this, now we go the second time you go through this experience, a clear mind or the mundane Nibbana, this is called fruition. The experience is clearer this time when it happens and it helps to seal the development, what has been let go of, so that the meditator does not lose it. So each one of these four attainments, Sotapanna, Sakadagami, Anagami, and Arhat level, the four times you go through the experience in their mind, one has the initial clearance of mind, where all past and future falls away, and you're in clear mind, but then you go through a fruition, which is the second time you experience it, and that seals it. So when you look at this, there's not four attainments, there's eight attainments involved here. The third time you go through, this is called Sakdagami. Now you weaken two additional fetters and return for only one more lifetime on the wheel. You are weakening craving for sense pleasure. Noticeably, you reduce thoughts and acts of cruelty and ill will toward any living being. You should not be at all. You will only return one more lifetime and experience it for the fourth time. This seals tight what has been gained. Now the fifth time one experiences clear mind. This is called an anagami. And this time you completely eradicate lust and hatred and you achieve total loss of sloth and torpor. Let go of craving for divine existences in heavenly realms of subtle forms, such as Deva Lokas, where angels also dwell in Christian customs 
And you like a craving for divine existence in immaterial realms, the Brahma Lokas, or the heavenly seats of the realms. You let go of all conceit, and then you let go of sloth and torpor. This now is a level called non-return. And when you experience it for the sixth time, moving to the clear mind through the opening of a mundane Nibbana, this seals tight what has been gained once more. The sixth time one experiences clear mind, this one is called the Arahat. And last two fetters now completely fall away. And one is called well gone. Here, restlessness is now completely gone. Then ignorance is totally gone. You become a non-returner. When you experience it for the eighth time, this seals tight all that you have been achieved. One is pure and lives with an imperturbable mind. It is not possible to disturb this mind. It simply cannot be disturbed. By practicing the tranquil wisdom insight meditation, TWIM, it is, if it is done correctly, you are completing the practice Buddhists call right effort, Sama Vayama. By using the six step cycle, we call the six R's. Your confidence and comprehension steadily grows stronger as you realize that you are actually moving along a super mundane path to experience the super mundane Nibbana. You have experienced seven mundane Nibbanas and the final super mundane Nibbana. This is due to the repetitious purification and retraining of the mind that occurs by repeating the six R's. When this is practiced in the correct way, you continue smiling and relaxing the brain. It strongly supports your intention to reach the proper condition necessary to fall into the state of cessation that is called niroda each time. What follows in the experience of the liberation of the mind, the opening of mind called Nibbana, you can refer also to Majima Nikaya number 64, the Mahamalokya Sutta. This is also an explanation here of what is happening whenever mind's attention moves off of the object of meditation and investigates a distraction or hindrance, Nivarana, which has arisen. That reference is found in Majima Nikaya number 138, Section 10, Udesa Vibhanga Sutta. This is important to consider because one can see how this happening and how we habitually attempt to cognize what has come to be if we move our attention to a distraction instead of staying with our receiving point called our object of meditation. Here is some of the text from the Udasavibhan Sutta. It says, how friends, 
is consciousness called distracted and scattered externally? Here, when a student has seen a form with the eye, if his consciousness follows after the sign of the form, is tied to the sh and shackled with gratification, which means personal pleasure and involvement in that sign or form, is fettered by the fetter of gratification in the sign of the form, then his consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally. When a student has heard a sound with the ear or smelled an odor with the nose or taste flavor with the tongue or touched a tangible with the body or cognized a mind object, a thought with the mind. If their consciousness follows after the sign of the mind object, the arisen hindrance, then it is tied and shackled by gratification in the sign of the mind object. It is fettered by the fetter of gratification sign of the object. Then their consciousness is called distracted and scattered externally. Now, this is addressing what it means to be fettered. Your attention is caught away from what you're doing when you are meditating or doing a task in life. If mind's attention is on an object of meditation, as contact happens at one of the sense doors, when mind's attention moves over to it, at that point, mind is distracted and it's scattered externally. This is because you are no longer with your object of meditation. After reading this, it makes complete sense to practice the steps of right effort by using the cycle of the six R's, doesn't it? And if a meditator leaves their object of meditation for the purpose of watching what came up until it goes away, or they move mind's attention to scan the body, or they investigate why something came up. In actuality, they are leaving one meditation and starting another one. Isn't that so? In reference to their meditation, this is the equivalent of what is mentioned as a scattered external mind. This is because mind's attention has left the object of meditation behind. It has moved over to initiate a different object, the distraction. Actually, it has started an investigative meditation instead. Whenever your curiosity and interest falls down concerning your object of meditation, then your mindfulness slips like this. But people then think they are just trying to see more closely impermanence to learn that Anicca is real. But this slip isn't necessary to watch to realize impermanence. When you practice tranquil insight meditation, you can see Anicca happening hundreds of times without ever leaving your object behind you. Because of this, you come to realize there is no exception to this universal law of change called Anicca. Everything is in a constant state of flux. Everything is changing all of the time. Some references for this information we're talking about that you can investigate the book called Living Legacy of the Buddha. It is written by Venerable Acharya Buddha Rakita. 
He is the elder Buddha Rakita, who was the founder and president of the Mahabodhi Society in Bangalore, India. He founded the Buddhist Meditation Society of the United States. In his book, in the chapter called On the Onward Path, at page 165, there is a very nice section explaining the paramis and the fetters. I am taking this for my lead in my explanations here. I hope that this helps you a little bit to understand better what the paramis and the fetters were and how they disappear through practicing your meditation and the Dhamma comprehension that goes along with this development. I wish you all well, and I hope that I can stay in contact with some of you. It was truly a privilege to see the of our meditation and bring a closer understanding between the Catholic faith and the Buddhist program of investigation of the mind. In Mataji Sasana Dipika, Mataji Reverend Kantike. So this is basically, this is what um, I did for the last 15 days, I guess. <laughs> so anybody have uh, any comments about this? Open floor. I'm hoping you can still hear me. <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Do you basically get what was going on with this? Sarah, how are you doing? Any questions? It was a really good session, thank you. Um, I'm just looking back over some of my notes, hoping I can think of a question for you. Um, a very simple one that comes up is, um, what's this longing for heavenly realms? This... Well, one of the things, if you when go to the- you, when, Upa, when does anyone yeah. feel that? When you are, one of the things about Two things that happen, it's actually a hindrance and um, where we, it hooks into the, it hooks into the, um, the hindrance of longing, okay? And most of the time it hits a student the last few days of a retreat. And what they're doing is longing for the experience to go through and experience clear mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is also at the other level is the higher you develop, you're longing for the ability to live in a heavenly realm instead of here. Rather than letting go altogether, you just dream about only having the responsibilities of a deva mm. to eat grapes. <laughs> Devas have to eat grapes, they have to eat all the time. It's really funny. They fall out of the realm they're in if they don't eat grapes. So they better like yellow grapes and blue grapes and green grapes because they have to keep eating grapes. And if they don't, they fall out of that realm. That's what descriptions tell us, you know? <laughs> so this longing, anything that is pulling you away, you know, you've sat in quiet mind. So if you're sitting in quiet mind um, at that level, you don't want to start to slip off with a longing for something okay. because that holds you back and prevents you from going into neither perception or non-perception and then being able to fall over and, and go through the, need, through the opening of the mind they call the experience of Nibbana. Yeah, so that's how that's working. As it's one of the things that was interesting with the women. Well, does that answer your question though? Pretty yeah, much. Thank yeah, thank you. That that's, that's really great. Yeah. Okay. And then see what they were asking curious from the 
uh, one perspective was what is happening to us when we go through and we go to clear mind. And this is something that I'm really um, very interested in as far as, um, as far as um, research is concerned, what I would want if I had something to say about the research that's being done on this, I would want them to figure out a way, which is very tricky, to wire somebody up and then have them go through the experience uh, of going through. And I would like them to tell me the difference between a newborn baby's brain and how pure that brain is and clear in its operation from a newborn baby's brain and compare that to somebody who goes through and experiences their mind. If they could catch that somehow in research, I think it would be absolutely magnificent because when we look at what is this this clear mind, you know, you've seen me draw this before, where I, I say, um, you know, I put it up like this, and I say, you know, here is this line, and here's the birth, and here is the death, and here is the past, okay, and here is the future over here on the right, and then we put the little loop on, and that's where you are in the little car, and you're in the present time. So this one is present, present time. Well, this present time is also can be a clear mind. If you, what, what would make it so it was a clear mind would be if I could eliminate this, all this stuff of uh, being concerned about these marks in the past of things that happened, if we could just get rid of those and not ever touch them again and not, not fall into the trap of you know, what if this happens? What if that happens about the future? If we could cancel the future completely in our mind and the past, we learn completely let go of falling into past again and again. And I'm trapped in doing, saying, acting anything again by repeating something from the past, some reaction. If we could stop that completely, what we have left is here. And actually, um, this becomes like a, a, a golden point, okay, of clear mind right there. And it's as clean as a babe, a newborn baby's mind. And if I, the reason I say I wish there was some way someone doing brain search could show us the difference between the mind of this, this new baby who's so happy, go lucky and eager to discover everything and bouncing around and learning and building his dictionary and his encyclopedia and his head step by step every day. And he's so excited and he's learning so fast and he's so pre precise, that baby's brain. But we can't do that now. So why can't we do that now? Because we're cluttered. That's why we can't do it now. And when I saw these women go through and I watched their faces, it was the most amazing thing, you know, because these women's faces, they were just so bright and their eyes were so wide. What has happened? Everything is so clear and my head is so light and I go outside and I look and what do I see? I don't see the normal green. I see technicolor. I see technicolor pinks and technicolor reds. It's just like the day when the storm was coming just before the thunderstorm and you see this technical, that's what they were seeing. I would say, go out now and walk in the convent garden where all the flowers are, then come back and tell me. And they come back and say, I can't believe it. Like, whoa, what is this? What happened? Everything is so clear. And then within 24 hours, they're finding out they're not nipping at each other. <laughs> when they're working chores the next morning, they're not nipping at each other at all anymore. They're perfectly clear in working and smiling and letting things roll off them, just as if you took a duck down beside the, by, beside the lake and you just poured water over his back and the water just rolls off. Nothing's touching them. Nothing's touching that little baby's brain. It's the most beautiful thing. Why can't we have that brain? Well, because we're cluttered, you see? And I would like people in the world, I would like them to be able to see this somehow on a brain scan, this baby's brain, and what's happened to this woman's brain 
when she goes through or a man's brain when they go through for the first hour after it happens what is just happens something has drastically changed and that's what is priceless how long that lasts and they say yeah well how long does it last well i say to them like this because you know i'm a mother you know i had these kids growing when they were growing up and so i'm thinking just like the mother hen with her hands or anything I'm thinking uh, you go to the hospital okay, and the doctor's there and the nurse is there and you have the baby. They hand you the baby and take it home and you have to take care of it. They helped you have that baby. They coached you. Your husband helped you in natural childbirth or whatever. You get through, you have that baby. When you have that baby and you wrap it up, wrap it up you go and you go home. And then it's up to you what happens to that baby. You see, are you going to take care of it? Are you going to be quiet? Or are you going to go out on the street, go into wild dancing and all this stuff and upset it? And so it fades away right away. And you start, then you're hanging on to this past event of running around dancing and everything. So you just cluttered it up, see? But if I try to explain to you, when you have these experiences, you don't just get up and, and you can, well, let me put it this way. The first time that I ever had that experience, I had so much life energy. This is what I always ask them. What about your energy? You have this big fluctuation of energy come in to your, to your uh, chest and really life energy that you could just do anything. And Banji said, okay, get on your bike and ride 15 miles. <laughs> so I rode 15 miles and I came back. He said, well, how was it? I said, can I do it again? <laughs> I had to go cook for the retreat where I was in Florida when that happened. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, we don't take care of it. So then it fades away faster, slower or faster. What makes it different? Is this little line, that little lesson, are you letting that past come back in and pressure you? Are you starting to be more overly concerned about what, where the future, 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 constantly worrying about that? What are you doing? Or are you taking this to your mind that you just had happened and you're taking care of it and you're going to keep meditating and get the fruition at least get the fruition of the attainment you're working on and then keep going with it and take care of it to some way yeah this is what we're looking at here so i think the newborn brain thing is a neat idea i started saying yeah you if you got it if you had this experience and you had touched it you saw it was real that's the big thing in the first two attainments okay in sodapan and sakadagami it blows your mind this is actually real i think that's the shock that it is actually real and if you look at it in terms of this it's a cleansing thing and you're letting go of all tension and tightness what was the source of your tension and tightness it was the pressure from the past or it was the pressure from the future. So let it go, you know? There's nothing says you can't manifest a different thing in the front of you, Cre be creative and figure out something, you know, and start uh, working towards, um, and the biggest one is if you're affected with depression, and I think this is what I wanna get across to everybody. If you know anyone suffering depression because of COVID, one of the things that you really need to remember is there are still ways to communicate with each other and help somebody who's suffering even worse than you. And stop being, you're, the problem is with, dep with depression, everybody thinks, oh, I'm so, so incredibly out of my mind with this happening to me. Let go of that for a day and see how you feel if you say <laughs> nothing is happening to me, everything is happening from me and experiment with it, experiment with it. It's a marvelous experiment for you to take and, and experiment with what happens if you have an impersonal perspective for even 24 hours and you look at it as nothing is happening to me, everything in this experience today is coming from me. You are painting your own canvas every single day. I help a lot of people in, uh, in the process of counseling with them by telling them go get a really white paper, put it on the wall where you can see it 
when you get up in the morning and you look at that paper and you are the palette that will paint that paper. What you think and you ponder on, I have no control over what you think and ponder on. What you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. I have that control of what you're gonna do in the present moment, but you have complete control and choice all day long. You need to come back, recenter yourself and look at how you really are steering the boat through life. You, know, you could be stuck in the doldrums right now, you know, but the wind does come back. It does, but you could be stuck in the doldrums. So you think and create, this is a time to remember that if you feel there is a mental pressure about something going on for you, uh, over a loss of someone, over uh, the inconvenience or the loss of financial stuff or the loss of anything, all that stuff. If you allow yourself to think it's only happening to me, why is it happening to me? Am I bad? Is this what happened to me? It's all my fault. There you are. Here you are. Depressed. Okay. But if you look at it a different way, okay, this is happening to everybody. Everybody needs to pull together. Everybody needs to figure out a way to work together. And you think, you know, I know that woman downstairs, she doesn't have any food at all because of this. Maybe I should give her part of my food. That's where we should be going. We should be, if you are totally out of it with depression, the best advice I can tell you is you find somebody that is blind or they lost a limb or they're so sick, but they're not contagious and dying and no one's there to take care of them. Do something help someone else. And I promise you one thing, even if you're poor and you haven't got a penny left, you will feel better if you are helping someone else. You are giving something because it's human nature and it works with our heart. It works with our mind. This is so, so, so important right now. So a lot of the issues of depression are you're not out of your mind. You're caught in your mind. That's where you are. You're caught in your mind. And because you're not moving out, that's why you feel so incredibly heavy and oppressed, you see? So you flip it, flip it. There's a sutta in the, in the Majima Nikaya about the hindrances, I kind of like it. It's the Sabhasava Sutta number two. And the Sabhasava Sutta has 16 different kinds of distractions and disturbances but the solution for everyone is like this abandon it and embrace or you know welcome the alternative the contradiction take a hold of the contradiction and go in that direction so when something's pushing you you take the contradiction and you push in that direction yeah and it, you go to the sabasava sutta i can give you a paper on that if I can, when I get home, if I can just remember to do it or someone should remind me to do it, okay? When I get back to Ulasnagar uh, tomorrow or the next day, I can try to send you uh, the Sabasava Sutta for you just to read the first page of it where it lists all these different things. And really what he's saying is abandon that and embrace the contradiction. I'm terrified. Okay, embrace the contradiction. I'm courageous. <laughs> and then you, you go and handle it. You stop being terrified. Go be courageous. I mean, I'll, I'll, let me see if I can read, read them, a couple of them to you so you understand what I'm saying. And I always laugh when I read it because it's so obvious. And his whole solution to all of the hindrances that bother you in your life is abandon them. If they're causing stress to you, let them go. Let them be. And smile about it. Laugh about the fact they're trying to get you. They're trying to get you again. They're coming to get you. Okay, all of the taints. And all of the taints, he's giving the first part of this, Sabasava Sutta is telling you, is it, let's see, make sure it's Sabasava. I might be wrong. Maybe it's Baya Barawa. Oh, it's the wrong one, okay. I'm sorry, it's the Baya Barawa Sutta and it's number four. I, I, I said the wrong one. Okay, here we go. You ready? So the first one was, um, if you're being unpurified in your verbal conduct, then what you do is you switch and you be nice in your verbal conduct. 
you're unpurified in your mental conduct, you just flip it and start thinking kind thoughts. You're unpurified in your livelihood resort. Then, then uh, what you do is you turn it over and you change your livelihood. You alter it, you fix it, alter it in some way. So it's not, if it's just not working, you alter it by figuring out what you like to do the most in life and you're the best at, and then you create that into what you want to do with your life as a job. I used to have human resources and that's what I did. I did that help people figure out what to do with that. Here's one. If you are evoking fear and dread, then you should make sure you're purifying you are, your um, livelihood and you decide to be create, uh, courageous instead. If you're full of lust, then you say, I'm going to be uncovetous. Okay. If your mind is full of ill will and intentions of hate towards someone, you immediately forgive yourself first. And don't beat yourself up because you're just human. That's number one. And number two is then you say, forgive your, the, yourself for doing that. And then I have a, a mind of loving kindness and forgive whatever you were thinking and go in the opposite direction and help the person instead. If you overcome with sloth and torpor, I am without sloth and torpor. You tell your mind. Now, what is this doing in this sutta here? It's basically saying, if I was uncertain and doubting, I have gone beyond doubt. What are you doing? You're in charge of what the direction of your mind is going to be. You are in charge. And so that's what people don't understand. Godamu was actually, he was teaching you a way of communicating with your mind where finally you can lean in a direction and your mind will obey you. And then with your mind is the forerunner of all states. And what happens is thought, then intention, then action. You control what the tone of the thought and the intention and the action is. Nobody else is steering your boat, only you. So this is where you learn the whole system he was giving. Um, if you're given to self-praise and disparagement of others, then you start not giving yourself self-praise and disparagement of others and uplift others instead is the opposite. If you are subject to alarm and terror, then you say to yourself, my mind will be free from any trepidation. And then you go and go to sleep with the mouse in the room and don't worry about it. <laughs> you see, <laughs> it's not, you see, if we create so many kinds of uh, unnecessary fears and create so many things, but most of it's coming from pictures in the past and in our mind driving our imaging, in our mind, how do we carry our imaging? It's part of your Eightfold Path. The next time we can look at the Eightfold Path in relationship to this and see how they all are hooked, all hooked in together. These are not isolated subjects. You see, the, the fetters and the paramis and the attainments are all related subjects. And this is part of the, the disconnection or the taking a part of the weaving that's been so unfortunate in modern times that we have gotten so far away, we don't relate the attainments are real. The, the doors are still open to accomplishing the attainments. Most people are saying, you know, if I could just become Sotapanna in this lifetime, Sotapanas were happening in the time of the Buddha, just listening to his lessons happening. But part of the separation of the Dhamma teaching and the practice of the teaching has caused uh, people to be confused about why doesn't this practice uh, work anymore the way it's all described in the text. I was just at a meeting last week and certain people basically said, I think people are very lost in meditation at that meeting. And they said, you know, if people are into so much meditation, 
well, then shouldn't they be going out and actually helping people? So they were thinking by being in, in uh, lust, by doing meditation might not be such a good idea. Let's go out and start doing and fixing. Well, they have a point, but they don't quite understand why that's happening. We need to go deeper and look at why something like that is actually occurring. Now, if you're talking about practicing uh, the breathing, it's, you're calming down, calming down, and it's much better than being out there in this, you know, vibration out there. That's wonderful. And it's restful. And that's it. You go home. Doesn't change anything the way you're handling a lot of your daytime stuff. Doesn't really maybe change a lot of stuff. But if you're talking Brahma Viharas, this is a whole different deal. Because when you're practicing metta, you cannot have thoughts of ill will. That is why those women were changing their behavior so quickly in this last retreat. That's why. Because when you have the metta operating in your mind, you cannot have thoughts of ill will. When it turns into karuna and you have thoughts of karuna in your mind, the compassion is operating you cannot have thoughts of cruelty toward anyone. It won't work. You're going to feel funny and it doesn't fit and you got to go do something else that's good in a better direction. You can't do it. Thinking of cruelty to get back at somebody, jealousy, hate, that kind of stuff. It doesn't work. And the third one is the mudita when you're experiencing being happy for someone else's success. Do you have any thoughts of discontent? It doesn't happen. Joy cancels out discontent. When you're joyful and happy, you don't walk around then having all this discontent of this and that and the other. It doesn't happen. And the last one is equanimity. And perfecting equanimity, we know it makes all aversion to anything go away. So if anybody has one more question, that's it. <laughs> one more question. Ah, the quiet multitude. <laughs> okay. So let's say our prayer. Let's come back, everybody, and say our prayer. Okay. Can we do that? Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu. Now wait just a second. I have a surprise for you. Just a second. 